Welcome to another episode of Bring Me Your Torch. I'm Jesse. And I'm Elaine. And we are here to talk about so much TV, my head hurts from all the excitement, and I can hardly contain myself. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty you're excited. Giggling at we have, we have a lot of shows to cover today. A lot of shows. We're going to try to bing, bang, boom our way through them and uh, entertain you and still let you know what the hell's happening in them as we keep moving along. So it's Tuesday, so of course we're going to start with Bar Rescue. And what do you think of this episode? So have they totally, completely slashed the budget, and now they're just sticking with <laughs> East Coast bars? <laughs> First we do 10,000 bars in New York, then we do another 10,000 in Philly. The next one will probably be in, uh, I don't know, where. bring them down to Washington, D.C. It's a bunch here. Yeah, they can't afford but... to bring the caravan down here and to fix up the bars. <laughs> Tri-state area, bring it to Connecticut. Yeah, Rom-rom. Connecticut as far as they'll go. And they wouldn't even call Connecticut. They'll be like, here in Fairfield, Connecticut, a suburb of New York City. (laughs) (laughs) This bar is in Glendale, Pennsylvania. It's called Plush. The owner, Bruno, owned it with his wife. They started a fight. She left, and it basically became the bar from hell, and I would kill myself before going there. What are your thoughts on that bar? I would kill myself if I had to work with my ex-husband or (laughs) ex-wife. Yeah, but you know, when it comes to needing money, just suck it up. Hate each other when you clock out, you know? Yeah, but if you're there, if that's your life and you're there 24 hours a day almost no i'm not dealing with i don't want to see my ex but at a certain point they just hate each other just because they're supposed to hate each other i don't even think they know why they hate each other they just get mad well so, they divorce for a reason and as we talked about before this theory. is why you don't yeah. go into business in a bar with someone's married to you they'd yeah. probably be happily married if they never bought this bar instead he's two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt his grandmother's house is in danger of foreclosure it's a mess so they call in john taffer and he shows up with mixologist mia master mastro that's her name and celebrity chef nick liberato who i've never heard of before but i'm sure he's a wonderful chef Nick Liberato, he's been on a million times. They go and watch them, and they bring along Sherry, Bruno's ex-wife, to watch, and they just talk. It was kind of a crap session on poor Bruno. I I have to think that there's fault on both sides, possibly, but she's just going on about how he owes her $65,000, has only paid three hundred. dollars It's so un-John Taffer-like for him to side with one or the other. In a situation where you have, like, divorce involved, usually he's like, okay, everybody, you're in trouble. And now this time he's like, oh, what do you think about Bruno being such an idiot? (laughs) And they go there and they watch. And sure, the bar staff has kind of gone to hell. It's a small, small town, but they're across the street from this big theater where shows come and they can't make any money off it. And they have a stripper pole where – Did the wife say later on, like, get rid of that stripper pole so these whores aren't spitting on it? I'm like, what? (laughs) It's kind of mean. I did not hear that (laughs) at all. But my favorite part part of this whole episode was in the beginning when he sends 200 people in and they have no idea what's going on. (laughs) But it's funny. They they act like, look, you can't even handle 200 people at one time. It's like, well, nobody can do it. (laughs) <laughs> they go in there and the guy's like hey can i need a drink and he basically screams at it. you can't scream at the people you want to make money off of it's Ooh, just, peanut is that what his name was peanut the guy the, the guy <laughs> peanut the bartender the balding bartender <laughs> oh he, peanut. he should have been sacked from the start what do you think well, about I mean, that heck chris the bartender actually when taffer asked them what should happen he said we should probably all be fired and that's a very yeah. frank and honest thing he was including himself in that conversation so Taffer comes in, does his Taffery thing, brings in Sherry, the ex-wife. Bruno loses his mind and tells him to get the F out of here. Taffer just walks out. It's like, you lost your chance. You blew it. And heads out. You blew it. You had your chance and you blew it. Sorry. (laughs) So the next day he comes back in and they talk and, you know, things have to change. They bring Chris back to the kitchen because when the 200 people showed up, Bruno just went and hid in the kitchen and didn't help anybody in the bar and just started touching Took crap shot. and then putting his hands on the food and drinking out of a beer. Let's be honest. In a perfect world, if we own a bar, we're all drinking while we're there while working. But in the real world, you can't do that or your business goes to hell, as you can see by plush. What percentage of bartenders do you think actually drink when they're on the job? That sounds like a question that we can send to Taffer. Why don't you, we should tweet him after the show and ask him. That's a really good, really good question. We should there. definitely tweet out Taffer about this because I think it's a really good. So we need a like, Taffer what percentage? tip. <laughs> Let's do Yeah, Taffer tip. 60% of bartenders drink in the U.S. <laughs> drink on the job. So what do you, what do you think? If they you don't stop now. They're just going to be part of another statistic. <laughs> I'd say you could probably say about 60%. I will say 64%. You like that? <laughs> Price is right. One dollar, one percent. 
They have Chris in the kitchen. They have Sherry running the front dining room. And Bruno does not like this. And this is what I'm talking about where he hates her just because he thinks he's supposed to hate her. She's doing a good job, and all he can think is just mutter to himself, oh, it's not right, shouldn't be here, this isn't good. And he looks like a madman just muttering to himself. Yeah, he's totally crazy, but I would be crazy too if I had to work with my ex. Well, that's why, after it's all said and done, Taffer sits down with him. He's like, you know what? My daughter was 12 when I got divorced, and we decided we're not going to do You tell, by the way, he put on the, the, the nice John Taffer voice, not the angry. It's like the, being nice to you and telling you this. My daughter was 12 when I was divorced, and I promise never to say a bad word about his mother. And yeah, total I want you BS. To do the same thing. Yeah. Total BS. Yeah. So they both cry it out, they hug it out, and they promise not to say bad things about each other. But you know the first time they have stress, it's going to come right back out. Oh, yeah. But Chris, by the way, did a phenomenal job in the kitchen. I was really happy because usually they get crapped on when they go back there. And he did a good job. The chef liked him. That made me happy. How do you just throw somebody in the kitchen and tell them to cook? I mean, did this guy have any cooking experience? Because if that was me, I'd just be making like grilled cheese sandwiches (laughs) and like hot dogs. They're doing good in the kitchen. They're getting better with Sherry outside helping out. And they go to the new bar and they go, one, one, two, three, turn around. And it was now no longer plush. And it was now Osteria Calabria. I don't even know what that means. (laughs) Well, he said an Osteria in Italy is like a cafe or like a bar kind of thing. And then Calabria is the area where Bruno's family was from in Italy. So I was trying to put it together. And I think, (laughs) was it Chris goes... Great. I love the new name. Plus, sounded like a place you go to see strippers with saggy boobs. <laughs> you say that? I totally well, agree with him, though. <laughs> yeah, plus does not sound like a place I want to eat. It sounds like a place I either want to buy or bet or see naked women at. <laughs> so everybody was happy, uh, as they are at the end of all of these. And they said six weeks later, after the relaunch, the food and beverage sales were up 21%, and Bruno had paid seven months on that 65000 that he owed Sherry, and his grandmother's house was no longer in the threat of foreclosure. But if you ask me, it's not going to last, because the first time the going gets tough, they're going to clash again, and that's going to be that. You think so? You know, it's hard. When your livelihood is in jeopardy and you need to make this money, you should turn yourself around. But I think that bad habits have a bad habit of rearing their ugly head. It's like when everybody goes on a diet. You're on a diet for a week or two and you're being fantastic and you're like, oh, I kind of want that pizza. And before you know it, you're back to doing what you used to do. And I think with a lot of these bars, it's what they have to face with. And I looked up some of the stuff online about people who have been there and reviewed it, and they actually thought it looked kind of cheap inside. You know what? I really didn't like the way that they redid the place. I thought it looked really tacky and fake Italian. Well, I wish you nothing but the best. Bruno and Sherry, pay her that money back and have your nice 12-year-old daughter have two loving parents. Enough of this. Under Vanderpump Rules. Oh, my favorite. You know, James is still a little turd. I don't like that guy. He's just sitting there whining. He, he just got won't fired. go away, will he? Hey, he has to pay off his Beamer somehow, okay? And he needs money for working from Lisa. I just... <laughs> and, oh. So he's figuring out what to do, and he talks to Lisa's son, Max, and Lisa's son, Max, just goes, you know what? Sit down with her, have a one-on-one conversation. But instead of doing that, he just shows up at at Pump and goes to work? What? So no, he doesn't work at Pump. He works at Sir. And Sir's, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought maybe he worked at Villa Blanca, whatever the hell the other one is called. They're all the same, aren't they? Pump the for, well, no. Well, what did, what did Lisa think about opening up her new restaurant, Pump? Pump. <laughs> Oh, darling, it was the hottest job she's ever had to open. The hottest restaurant I've ever had to open. We're finally open. And it just took so long and so many resources. that This day is just so great. And why, why did you put a tree inside the building? Oh, darling, I wanted this sexy, sexy garden. And I wanted all my friends and the gay community to come out and relish this experience, darling. Well, you did a very good job, Miss Vanderpump. So, Thank you. So, so James goes to Sir to work, and they're like, uh, wasn't that mofo fired? And he's like, I, I, he starts whining. I, I was trying to do a English accent there, and it failed so poorly last <laughs> I did. I, I just mumbled instead, sorry. So he then comes back, and this is, this is all such BS. So this is the biggest night of the year, whatever, for, for Lisa Vanderpump. So he just so happens to go back to work this day. This is all production contrived, I think. Yeah, but Peter leaves. Peter actually leaves Sir and goes over to Pump and asks Lisa Vanderpump's husband if they've actually, in fact, fired James. 
And he's like, yes, get him out of here. We never want to see him again. And so Peter goes back and is like, get out of here. They don't want anything to do with you. And then the next day he shows up with a letter. James shows up with a letter for Lisa <laughs> and saying like, oh, I wanted to write you a letter. Oh, I feel so bad. Can you please? It's what English people do. Yeah. Apparently it's what and the Brits do. I asked my friend Matt, who is probably listening right now, who's one of our biggest fans, who's also from England. I said, I watched this show last night. And he said, English people write letters and then read them to people while they're staring at them. Is that true? He goes, well, I guess, I guess English people do like to write letters, but, you know, most English people are idiots. <laughs> they like to write letters, but the point of writing a letter is because you can't be there in person to express your feelings, right? So he should have sent the letter and then waited for a response rather than read it in front of her. It's, what an awkward because, guy. Because it's a TV show, you know she's going to hire him back, right? Well, she has to. Yeah, because you need to have more drama and more. But hey, they're both English, so I don't understand like where the loyalty is there. Ooh, ooh! I asked Matt also about her accent. I'm like, what kind of accent is that? It doesn't seem like a real accent. And he said she's speaking the Queen's English, so it's like uber proper, and that you can even tell she's putting it on in the show a little more than she should be. Because I I I went to show him some other YouTube clips, and she definitely doesn't have as strong an accent in some of them as she has in others. It's kind of how like Sofia Vergara suddenly you, she sounds like Charo, and you can't understand what she's saying when she's at an award show, and then you hear her in other places, and it's fine. Oh my God, I'm sorry, Matt, our British uh, listener, but it sounds so <laughs> horrible. Please never do this. Okay. Oh darling. <laughs> Darling. Oh, darling, I have... danced with the queen last night. She had her wheelchair out and her walk on. She was going around the dance floor in the circles, darling. All right, enough, Lisa. Go back into your cage. <laughs> and you have Kristen and Tom. Now, Kristen is crazy. I mean, Tom might be a douche, but Kristen is crazy because she keeps saying she's over Tom, that Tom has to get over her, but she's obviously the one who is the stage five clinger, am I right? But I'm wondering why she took so long to get all of her stuff out of his apartment. You know, what has this been, like six months at this point? Hold on, and why didn't they move out of the apartment? Like, Because Ariana and Tom are together in the same apartment that he shared with Kristen, so why didn't they just start over and start fresh? Well, he probably just said, you know what, she left, I'll stay here. But he still had the cable box that she was paying for, and she'd come back and get it. And now, I'm going to be honest, Tom suffered the greatest loss of the episode. He lost his DVR shows on the, <laughs> the cable box. And that was his main concern is, can I just keep it? I have some shows I wanted to watch on there. <laughs> so I think Tom has been my new favorite cast member from this season. His he, face looked a little better this week. wasn't as beat in as it was the week before. It's probably just the makeup, but yeah. He's like my favorite this season just because he's happy with Ariana. He doesn't give a crap about Kristen anymore. He doesn't seem to let the whole situation with Jax phase him. He's just, I, I don't kinda, know, I think, he's, I think he's having the best season yet. I think I like Jax the most, but not because I actually like him, because he's so stupid, and I think it's funny watching him. <laughs> it's, it's like when a monkey figures out something and it thinks it's smart. It's like, no, you're still a stupid monkey just because you got something right once. Yeah. And he always thinks, like, I had this revelation. I, it only took me 10 months to realize it was bad to sleep with my best friend's girlfriend. Wow, I'm so <laughs> smart. I'm evolving. It's like, yeah, maybe in 10 more months you realize what a moron you are. That's so. great. I love it. So, and, and Kristen just hates Ariana, right? Well, so, I don't know. So did he, Who cares? Did that, Tom, that relationship she cheated on Tom and then he cheated on her with Ariana? Is that what happened? I mean, we don't really know the timeline. I think it was always said that Tom cheated on Kristen in Vegas with some random person. Mm -hmm. And she always felt like she had to get back at him, maybe. And so she cheated with Jax. But it didn't come out until like a year or a year and a half later that Jax and Kristen had actually banged. Yeah. Bang, bang, bang. And Stassi, I still think it's just finding crap for her to do. I don't think she's I totally her. agree. She has no place in this season. She basically just showed up and was kind of mean to Sheena. I know they had this big back back and forth in the past seasons. And is Sheena horrible too? I don't know that. It, it's Well, you have to remember, bad... Sheena's the one that banged uh, Brandy Glanville's husband. Not Eddie, Eddie Cibri Cibrian. Yeah, no, it's, is, it, it's is that Leanne him? Rhyme. She's with, no, she, he's married to Leanne Rimes now. Yeah, exactly. And Sheena was okay. actually banging him while he was married and pregnant. But how does, how does that affect Stassi? Because Stassi always talks trash about Sheena, and she did in the first season saying, like, oh, you're a homewrecker, this and that. But I guess Stassi just hates Sheena for just because Sheena, I don't know, Sheena's kind of annoying. She's an attention whore. And yeah, I mean, Stassi is one of the mean girls, and I guess 
Sheena had been tweeting some, retweeting some stuff about her, but who cares? Like Stassi, just the fact that she's going to lunch with her dad to talk about Sheena is pretty sad. Like, couldn't she go to lunch with a friend and not her dad? And by the way, I think Andy Cohen needs to get on on it and start coming up with some new plot lines because this is the second plot in like two weeks where people are mad at someone else. They go, I didn't tweet anything. I just retweeted it. <laughs> Lesson was so on, on below deck. Too. Yeah. I love how she went to New York City to clear her head. Most people go out like where the weather's nice and the people are nicer or more relaxed and chill. Usually you don't go to New York to clear your head. You go to like the West Coast, California to clear your head. So I think general consensus is she went there to get her own TV show and it probably didn't get picked up. <laughs> no, seriously, because she was the breakout star before she left. And it made sense to have, you know, she, Stassi takes New York. Yeah, like now that. she's nothing. Like this show is nothing. I, mean, I could do without her in this show. It's gonna be interesting to see if they integrate her back into it and make her the queen bee on the show. But whatever. She doesn't want to come back to Sir though. She doesn't want to bartend anymore. Like Lisa it's Vanderpump happen. made it. No, Lisa Vanderpump made it clear that she had moved on. I don't see it happening. You probably could somehow find out right now if someone just went there <laughs> and saw her. She's not. She's so, not bartending anymore. The Walking Dead. What do you think? This was kind of a this is a good intense episode, but it was a more character driven episode than an action episode. Yeah, that's the problem. I'm I'm more about the cliffhangers and the zombies <laughs> coming out and popping well, out. There was a cliffhanger in this episode. It just wasn't the kind of cliffhanger we, we talk about. <laughs> yeah, more like no. a car hanging off a cliff. <laughs> this one wasn't, I don't think, as exciting as last week's. But you find out what happened to, to Carol and Daryl and Meryl and Harold and Terrell that and guess what? I was right. Go back, listen to the tape. It's going to be Noah who shows up there with uh, with Daryl back at camp. Yep. That Say was a good, good job. prediction. See it like you mean it. Yeah, you called it. That's more like it. That's what I wanted to hear. So Carol is definitely a mess this episode. And it's kind of just been intercut with all the crap that's happened to her over the past year, whether it's getting kicked out by Rick or those girls being buried after she killed them or killed one of them at least. Do you think Carol makes it out of the season alive? I don't. You well, Carol? Yeah. I don't. I I can see Carol. She's lost. She. I think she would happily lay down her life to save someone else. Type thing. Like, I don't think she would kill herself suicide, but I think she would have no problem be at peace with dying. She would be with in her mind. She maybe she'd be with Sophia again. That kind of stuff. I think she might be a goner in the, in the finale. I don't know. So I thought Carol was actually a plant, and that they were going to just have her infiltrate the hospital. Um, and not necessarily get, you know, hit by the car. <laughs> that, I mean, that's talk about method acting, getting hit by the car if you're a plan. <laughs> but I think that it's only a matter of time now between them going back, grabbing Rick and just regulating. But the question is, are Glenn and Abraham and all them going to come back and join in? Or are they just gone for the foreseeable future, do you think? I don't know. If that were me, I would definitely be out of Atlanta. But yeah, not, nothing good's happening in Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and during the whole mess where everybody was running around, they ran into Noah, who then robbed them of their uh, of their weapons, then almost was killed by Carol. <laughs> yeah, they need to just get out of Atlanta. I mean, obviously they want to yeah. get Beth back, but... And, you know, Noah's a good dude. I think they, they actually figured that out relatively quickly, which is why they didn't just put a bullet in his head afterwards. Wait, but was he a it's... good guy? Yeah, I think he, you know, he's scary. He, does, he doesn't want to hurt them, but he's survival of the fittest. But I don't think... You can tell he's not like a governor or like a psycho. It's... And he's, I think you can partner with him, especially once they figure out he knows Beth and is friends with Beth. You can trust him, maybe sleep in there without thinking he's going to kill you. Yeah. So, so next week it looks like that's when it's all going to come to a head. And so a lot of the stories, whether it be Beth, whether it be Carol and Daryl and Rick and the gang all converge. And they just go, you know, I'm, tell the hospital that hell's coming and I'm coming with it type thing. <laughs> but the most important thing that happened on Sunday night didn't even have to do with the show. It was Emily Kinney. She's the one who plays Beth in the show. She had pretty much the greatest tweet ever, and I almost lost it. Did you see this? Oh, I saw it. She t she she tweeted a picture of her bottom, to put it nicely, and said, "A sexy pic of my bum to celebrate the new Walking Dead tonight." I heart Daryl. I heart the Walking Dead. And I'm like, and I heart you, Beth. But your name is not really Beth. If I met her, like, hello, Beth. Actually, my name is Emily. No, you're Beth. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> and you were I'm sleeping not creepy. with Daryl. You broke my heart. <laughs> I'm not creepy. You just love me. Hey, I tweeted at her and I said, our podcast loves you. Listen, and I told her to go to the exact moment where I said she was on my list of crushes. <laughs> oh, yes. I maybe scared her away. I don't know. Maybe she's just mad that Baylor was number one. <laughs> yeah. 
Homeland, I got to tell you, this is probably the best episodes in season two. Why? You agree with that? No, I don't. What? What? I think last season or last episode was better. No way, because last night I thought there was a very big possibility of Saul blowing his brains out. I thought that was going to happen. Yeah, you like the scene with Saul. Well, I mean, here's here's what I liked. First of all, the whole thing with Carrie was resolved really quickly. Oh, she's not a psychopath. Well, she is crazy, yeah. but that's crazy. You know, I was drugged. Okay, yeah. we know what happened there. So it's not that could have been another whole five episodes. Carrie, we can't trust you. No, she was drugged. She goes back, and I, I had to laugh though when she's like, "It's not fair what they did to me. It doesn't feel like it's fair." And, you know, I, I agree with her, but was it fair to bang Ion and then make him fall in love with you? No, it's what you do. Well, I just think it's interesting at the <laughs> end that who, who's the guy at the end? The Actually, oh, Khan. actually revealed, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's. I think it's official now. Connor's a good guy. So he Connor's doesn't a good be guy because he's. I think he's going to try to sleep with Carrie. That's my prediction. <laughs> I don't think he's helping her to sleep with her, but he may sleep with her after helping her. <laughs> I think he likes her. I think he's a little hot for her. I also think he doesn't like what the female agent is doing. Yeah. I don't think like he doesn't like being a pawn in somebody else's game. So he's going to go out on the limb and try to help her out, which is nice because she definitely needed help. I, I, I totally agree. I think there are too many people on uh, on the Pakistani side and nobody really on the American side. So it was just Carrie, Peter. Peter Quinn, yeah. And then Saul's like hanging out with the terrorists the entire time. And the CIA, the head of the CIA is completely useless, as is the ambassador. Like so The ambassador is useless. I like the head of the CIA. Here's the thing. What does Pakistan have to gain from helping the terrorists? I have no idea. And I kept asking, why are they doing, like, why is Carrie doing everything that she's doing? And they're like, oh, she's trying to get back Saul. But that's not what was going on in the beginning of the season, right? Saul only got captured the last, you know, se- or episode or two. So what yeah, is yeah. Carrie trying to do now? They're trying to figure out who was behind the death of Sandy, her predecessor there, because they figured out that it was being taped by someone who worked for the Pakistani intelligence. So there's some kind of bigger mystery that she was trying to figure out. And I guess they didn't like her trying to figure out and they were going to take her out. Any, I think any it's all there. getting lost throughout the season. And they had the terrorist when they when they had the UAVs over the terrorists where they could see, obviously, Saul was being held. So why didn't they just bomb the camp when they could? Well, here's the problem that Carrie is kind of in a lose lose situation here. That she said, kill kill the bad guys and, and poor Saul will be collateral damage, and they act like she was a monster. Then she does a reverse and saves his life, and he acts like she's a monster for lying to him. You, you can't win here with poor Carrie. I thought Carrie was on point this episode, and she was being competent and showing what we all think she should be. So, why did know? she lead him straight back into the terrorists? Saul was captured by the terrorists, but he figured out and he escaped figured out how to get out of there and escaped and he's running through the desert and he called up Carrie. He was like, I need to get out of here. And what else did he say to her when he was on the phone with her? He said, Carrie, if I get taken back into custody with these terrorists, Carrie, promise me you're going to pull the trigger. Is that what he said? I promise. I promise I will do that. <laughs> of course I'll do that. And so, so he has to run through the desert for 20 miles to get to the, get to the next town where they have a, someone on the ground. And of course, the terrorists in the Taliban just figure out that they're there and they come take. Here's why Carrie did this. So Carrie was on the phone on the satellite trying to tell him where to go to get out of there and get free. But I think it became very apparent that he wasn't going to get out of there and Saul was going to kill himself. And I think she let him write to the terrorists so that he could be kept alive and then they would get him back through a prisoner trade somehow. But what I loved at this episode, what I thought was phenomenal, is that in the first two seasons, anything was possible. It didn't do what standard TV shows did. You found out that Brody was a terrorist in the second or third episode of season two, which most shows would have done that the entire season to figure that out. So when they were sitting there, I was waiting for a satellite photo of poor Saul just to blow his brains out. And I was I was on edge. And that's not something I've been with with Homeland in a long, long did you time. you think he was going to shoot himself? I, di- I really did. And you would have been like, oh, my God, I never saw that coming. I, I'm going to miss Manny Patinkin, but that's why the show is great, because you never saw it coming. It doesn't matter that he did or didn't. The fact that I thought it might happen shows, I think, the power of this episode and why it was so good. And you think it could definitely support the longevity of the show in general? I think anything has to be on the table. That's what was in the first couple of seasons, and that's what we loved. But the question is, what happens next week? Does Saul, I keep wondering, will Saul die anyways after all of this? Or will Quinn take out the five prisoners during the transfer? Is it all going to go to hell? Are they going to get away? What's going on? Yeah. I mean, we can stay tuned. I don't think they'll get rid of Saul's character, but, you know, they did get rid of Brody's character. 
Yeah, it, and and I love Manny Patinkin, but man, I would have blown my mind if they had just if he just blown his brains out on the Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> Real Housewives of Atlanta? I still didn't watch so I'm sorry. How did how was it this week? Um, I thought it was okay. I thought the first episode was the best just because you see what's going on with Apollo going to jail and the sentencing and everything. But yeah, overall it was an okay. You just have Nini who's a total arrogant and full of herself performing in Los Angeles. You have Candy who doing what? Uh, she was like a dra- I think she was supposed to be a drag queen, and she was a vo- what? she was a voiceover for this like orgy sex performance what? thing in Vegas. Yeah, it was really <laughs> bizarre. What? Yeah, really weird. She went from The Apprentice to that, so I don't know if she's on the way up and up or she's just trying to salvage her career. But she apparently thinks she's too good for the rest of the housewives. Uh, you have Cynthia who- Cynthia who got featured in Ebony a ten. 10- 10 page spread or seven page spread in Ebony, I believe. And so she had a party to commemorate that. And Apollo shows up and he's trying to apologize to Kenya because he apparently, we find out in this episode that he apparently lied to everyone. He had, what? He lied to everyone telling no in the last, in the last season, he told everybody that he met up with Kenya in Los Angeles and was and she offered him fellatio. So he went. He had this. Did she accept? No, no. He accept. You mean she offered it? Oh, yeah. Did, she, did he accept? No, he said apparently like they had met up, but Sucker. she was like, "Oh, I'm married, this and that." And so it was this huge thing that everyone like kind of turned against Kenya because they all thought she was just running around giving married men offers for you know. Did she offer him kind of lingus? But it turns out he lied about the whole thing. And he said he wanted to apologize because he was going to jail. So, real question. Yeah. How many of these shows, how much of this is real and how much is contrived for the show? Oh, I think it's completely real. Yeah. Do you, do you really? Yeah, you don't yeah. think people, people don't act like bigger idiots when there's a camera on them because they know they have to make a plot line? I think people act like idiots, but I think this is still the drama that happens between them. I don't think they're best friends by any means. They're not going to go off air and be like, yeah, let's go have some tea together. Yeah, it's that it makes they make it look like they're hanging around. They're just good friends, but they probably have filming days and they don't. No, have no, no, no. Days, right? There's one thing that you always have to <clears throat> notice with these reality shows. There's one person in the group. Most of the people in the group hate each other, or at one time or another <laughs> hate each other. There's always one person that holds the group together. If there's not one friend that's on each person's side, the group falls apart. Other than me, do you have a friend of me? Um, I had a friend of me, but then I cut her out. Cut it out. Well, I keep saying this. I'm going to watch this one a week. I know. I know the new Housewives is coming back in a little bit, so I'm going to get in that one. I don't know. The Real Housewives but, of Beverly Hills comes on tonight, and I think it's about an hour and 45 minutes, and I'm so excited about it. <laughs> it's on Bravo, right? Yeah, it's on Bravo. And they used to actually have it on Monday nights, but because Euro so Hollywood and Vanderpump Rules is on Monday, they had to put move this to Tuesday night. But I'm really excited about it. Woohoo! You know, there are two new people coming on. I kind of actually know who they Do are. Do you? But, yeah, but for the most part, these other people, who are they? I, I mean, I know Lisa Vanderpump, but some of these people, are they just famous for being famous? I don't get it. Well, I'm Andy ex- Cohen says they're famous. We have to just take his word for so it. So I'm really excited, though, because they're getting rid of two people. And one of the people they're getting rid of, actually, Ron really hated her. And so did I. Her name is Carlton. She was one of the British castmates from season four last season. And did she write a lot of letters? I know. Right. And all she ever talked about was crucifixion. And like, I don't know. She was so bizarre. Like a buzzkill. <laughs> she just didn't fit into the cast. But now with Lisa, what is it? Rena? So we have the two new people are Lisa Rinna and Eileen Davidson. And it's funny. I know Lisa Rinna by name. I didn't know Eileen Davidson by name. I looked her up. So I'm going to admit this to everybody listening. In the early and mid-90s, I watched Days of Our Lives a lot. <laughs> my, well, my mom watched it, so I'd be home from summer. I'd watch it. Then I'd be home, and she'd be at work. And I'd be like, hey, Mom, can you believe it? They brought back Gina, or they brought back Hope, or whatever the hell her name is. <laughs> yeah, Lisa Rinna was a character named Billy. She came back, and she was Bo's new girl at the time. And then, then Eileen Davidson was someone named Kristen. She was a whole thing. She was in love with the guy who was possessed by the devil. You know, it's a whole, it's a whole thing, believe me. But it's funny that they're adding on, coming on this show. Is Eileen Davidson married to somebody famous? I don't, I've never heard of her. Because you know Lisa Renata. Now, her husband is Harry Hamlin. Do you know who he is? No. Really became big. He was 
Perseus in uh, the Clash of the Titans that came out like in the 70s. And then he was on L.A. Law. So he's kind of a big deal must back be like in the 80s. like 100 years old. Nah, maybe not 60s. Back in the 80s. He was like a big deal back then. I mean, L.A. Law was a big thing, you know, in 1987 or something. But no, nah, he's, he's as old as she is. So I'm... And she was hot. She was hot stuff before she blew up those lips. I'm really surprised that they're bringing on two pretty well-known actresses who are still relatively well-known. Because, you know, Kim no, and Kyle, Kim and Kyle were, um, were childhood actresses. You know that, 40 years ago? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but these women are still... I, I don't want to say they're in their prime, but... Well, the question is, they work together off and on over the past 20 years. Are they actually friends? Because, you know, you work with people. It doesn't mean you like them. I think it'd be funny if they were. You find out they didn't like each other. Yeah. I don't, you know, this I am more apt to give this one a chance than Real Housewives or than Real Housewives of Atlanta because I actually know some of the people on this. Oh yeah. Kind of. You know Nene though from um, Celebrity I, I Apprentice. Know, I know her, but I don't know her. Like, I, I don't know why she's famous. Where at least I know these two actors. I know Lisa Vanderpump now from Vanderpump Rules. I have some kind of base. Yeah. Are you gonna watch it? I, I will do my very best to watch this one. Please do. We have a lot of our listeners that love Real Housewives of Beverly Hills. So okay, we need to be talking we, about it on a weekly basis. Okay, okay. Stop giving me the ninth degree or second degree or whatever. Oh, you <laughs> forgot about Yolanda. Wait, who's Yolanda? Yolanda's married to David Foster, who cures cancer. Well, that's pretty cool. I mean, that he cures cancer now that she's married to him. Yeah, Yolanda, Yolanda's husband, David Foster, apparently cures cancer and also writes songs with Stevie Wonder and the likes of... Very superstitious writings on the wall. <laughs> so just like I have to watch these Real Housewives shows, you have to watch 90 Day Fiancé. And I realize I missed the first two episodes, so I have to go back and watch them. Crazy stuff going on. Is it on. really? I can't oh, my God. I'm only going to go through quickly a few of these couples. So there's Jason and Cassia. She's the Brazilian one. And she's insane, but she's also the most honest because she keeps talking about what will happen if you know this just doesn't work out. Or everybody else is just talking like it's going to happen. She can see what a weirdo this dude is and thinks it might not work out. And they're walking down the street, and what a coincidence. They go by uh, a little itsy-bitsy, teeny-weeny little Brazilian bikini, and she's like, I want to put that on. And she's coming out there, and he's whining about it. Like, I'm not comfortable with having, uh, having you wear that. It's like, dude, your fiancé – is like this hot chick in a little bikini. Shut up. Is she really you know? hot? She thinks she's going to be a model, and she's not like cover of L if that's still a thing. Hot, <laughs> but she's hot enough that if you, she's hot. I'll put it that way. You know who am I to be a, a chooser? And who cares what he wants anyways? He's spineless and he's in a dork. <laughs> and he spineless. Does, she'll do whatever she wants. She is. So he's out doing whatever the hell he does for a living, and she's just sitting at home and she looks in the drawer and what does she find but a Playboy? <laughs> And apparently she had made known to him that she is very, very jealous and she doesn't want any of these naked magazines around. And she starts flipping out and running around, opening up different drawers, trying to find different naked. And she comes in, he yells at her and she takes the magazine, and starts rolling it up. And he's like, don't do that. It's worth ten dollars. A little turd. Hold on, hold on. What channel is this on? This is on TLC. TLC. Okay. Do you think it's on demand? I, I hope it is. Go look. It is so I need to check freaking it out, good. This is it, it, it's just ridiculous. He's a, and apparently he, he says, I'm selling these on eBay to make money. Yeah, okay. That, that, that sounds smart. So then you have Muhammad and Mama June. Wait, I mean, wait, uh, he's Muhammad selling and Playboy on eBay to make money. Yeah. Who the so hell buys Playboy one. anymore? Well, if you have like vintage ones from the 60s, you know, Marilyn Monroe was he's in them. He's waiting like to that. turn like 100 years old so he can get on eBay and sell them. I can only assume that's what he's doing. Then you have, then you have Muhammad and Mama June, or I mean Muhammad and Danielle, who looks like Mama June, and Who's Mama all June? she does from from Honey Boo Boo, the mom. Oh, and, I... Boo. <laughs> <laughs> and all she does is cry because she's old and poor and has no money, and she hides the money problems from Muhammad because she's certain that if he finds out she's broke, that he's gonna. Get out of there. I, I'd say it's a pretty fair assessment. I think I'd be part. out of there. I thought she was broke, <laughs> I mean, and I'm not even married on, to her. Let's, let's be honest here. So she's lying, and then she's trying to get the wedding, and she's like, oh, I'm going to get my dress for like $200. And like, That's too much, Mama. And I'm like, what the hell is happening here? So finally, she tells him all about it, and she's crying, and he's like, he's, you can tell he's actually pissed off. And I'm like, oh, here it comes. He only wanted the money. He goes, why did you lie to me? Because I was afraid you weren't going to stay if you found out I had no money. And he basically says to her, you know what? 
I'm not mad about that. I'm mad that you lied to me, and I will leave if you keep lying to me. No, 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 and no, I think no, we should... no. He's mad because of that, but let's be serious. A green card <laughs> is worth more than any of this. <laughs> His face, though, I, mean, I, I tell you, I almost bought it. Maybe he's just really good, but I bought it. I was like, wow, maybe I was totally wrong about this, dude. So they're going to start fresh? So maybe Muhammad's an okay dude. I don't know. I mean, I think maybe things are just that bad in Tunisia. And he do anything to get the hell out. Yeah, of course. <laughs> so uh, there's two more I want to talk about quickly. Amy is my favorite. She's the one from South Africa. She's absolutely beautiful. And Danny is her boyfriend slash fiance, and he's like super religious. They can't have sex until marriage. And they can't even live together. So she's living with her brother, soon-to-be brother-in-law. And this whole family is weird as hell that – Finally, they go out on a date and have alone time. They come back and watch a movie, and they're not even – they're maybe holding hands. And the brother walks in and goes, hey, can I hang out with you guys? And they're like, um, okay. Where do you – where should I sit? I know where I'll sit, between you two. And basically just sits down on top of them and gets between them and looks and goes, what are you guys up to? She's being a total you know, crotch block there. That's so and weird. You can tell it. She's like, what the F? Like, come on. If I can't have sex with my boyfriend, can I at least, like, sit next to him? So he eventually leaves, and Danny was like, I'm, I'm very mad. I have to talk to him. But guess what? I think he should murder his brother. And if he <laughs> murdered his brother and I was in the jury, I'd let him off because it's inappropriate. And to make matters worse, his father's coming to visit next week, and he's racist. So that'll be fun. That'll be awesome. <laughs> And finally, Yamir and Chelsea, he's the one who was basically in One Direction in Nicaragua and left to come here. Hey, guess what? He's no longer in the band because the band no longer exists. His friend is basically like, you're responsible for killing this band. I hope you're happy. <laughs> he's just like pissed off. So but it's okay because as his soon-to-be mother-in-law said, the uh, meatpacking plant down the street hires a lot of Hispanics. So <laughs> That's wrong. That's just wrong. <laughs> no kidding. The, he's like, uh, I understand that much English. I know I say this about a lot of shows. I know you say that to me about a lot of shows. Watch this. It's so good. And I will. it's like a train wreck. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> laugh. What are you giggling about over there? So, so I'm heading back to Connecticut for the holidays, but we're going to find a way to get in touch and put a couple of podcasts out over the next couple of weeks. Am I right? Yep. Sounds good. Because distance don't mean a thing. We got to get this out there because – you're going to be driving. You're going to be traveling for the holidays. And what are you going to listen to if not us, right? Yep, I agree. Damn right. And before we go, just remember, you can still find us at www.bringmeyourtorch.com. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter, too. What are those addresses? Facebook.com slash bringmeyourtorch or Twitter.com slash bringmeyourtorch without the H. Dork. Yeah, only losers spell torch on Twitter with an H. That's right. <laughs> And, of course, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, all that good stuff. Download and rate us. We want your ratings. We want everybody to see how great we are because how are new people going to know we're awesome if you don't tell them? Oh, yeah. Right. And talk about the real-world survey that you put together. We're going to put it back out there again maybe tomorrow morning or later this week. Before the Real World Skeletons premieres on December 16th, we're going to have a spectacular, extravaganza show talking about this season of the real world and our favorite seasons from years past. So we're going to put this back out. Go on there. Take it. I know. Some people have gone, you know what, Jesse? There's too much information. I'm sorry. There's been over 200 people who have been on The Real World, and i got to put them all out there because it's not fair if I exclude anybody. Well, you have you know? to. You have to. And the fact is, is you kind of already know who your favorites are, so just go through and try to find them. But I am stressing because from the results, I can see that some people are going off the challenge. Challenge shouldn't be a part of this. It's only The Real World. Forget the challenge even happened. Well, you can't. But, well, you, but there's, a, there's a bunch of phenomenal people who are great in the real world who have never been on the challenge. And there are people who really, you know, blossomed and flourished on the challenge who are just kind of eh, on the real world. Don't worry. We'll have our own challenge one. Kind of <laughs> so anyways, that was a long winded way of saying we'll take the survey. It'll be on our Facebook page pretty soon. And until that time, just remember, you may have come here as a stranger, but you're leaving as a friend. We'll see you next time. I'm bringing your torch. Bye.